Great. So we are talking about film distribution I hope channels as well today, and um, and um, how they um, basically have evolved, are evolving, and uh, changing the um, changing the film industry, hopefully for the better. This webinar is based on a thought leadership article that I wrote a few days ago. And should you like to read the um, uh, written version of uh, this, um, this um, a thought leadership content, then you can actually subscribe to our um, uh, to our content on our website, crefovy.com. So if you go on store and you can find the uh, so yearly subscription plan, which is um, 100 pounds. And for the French version, it's 100 euros on crefovy.fr slash store. Okay. Obviously we've come a long way since the, the, 20s you know when the film industry was invented and um, the distribution channels and media that exist today are um, very different from uh, from what used to be um, in existence at the beginning I mean film distribution which is also called film exhibition and and, um, and film distribution and exhibition is the process of making a movie available for viewing by an audience. And it, this is usually uh, this work of film distribution, the task of a professional film distributor who would determine the marketing and um, release strategy for a film, for a movie and the media, the support by which a film is to be exhibited or made available for viewing. So, the film may be exhibited directly to the public through movie theaters, television, or personal home viewing. So that includes physical media, video on demand, download, um, television programs through broadcast syndication. And um, yeah, so let's talk about the movie theaters, which were really the first medium on which films were basically projected. And so the first, um, the first screening ever was done in Paris in December 1895 by the Lumière brothers. And uh, they, sh they screened 10 short films that they had made with their own cinematograph. After that, and during the first decade of the motion pictures, so in the, you know, at the beginning of the 20th century, the demand for movie, as well as the amount of new productions and the average runtime of movies became such that it became viable to have theaters that would no longer show live acts, but focus only on films. And so some movie theaters were created. Apparently the first one was in the Eden Theater in La Ciotat in France, in the South of France, which showed the, uh, the film called L'arrivée d'un train en gare de La Ciotat in 1899. And then the US also was very uh, uh, quick to, um, to catch up and quite a few theaters were uh, created and you could, a uh, lot of them, you could actually go and see a movie for only five cents, so a nickel, and that's why they became to be known as Nic Nickelodeons. So they flourished between 1905 and 1915. So um, after that, there was accelerated uh, sophistications of movie theaters and through in particular the creation of multiplexes and megaplexes, even drive-ins where you can just stay in your car and watch a film. But of course, there were some outdoor movie theaters as well and um, 3D movie cinemas to see more, um, you know, documentary kind of style of films, IMAX as well for more, again, documentary and very widescreen um, topics and premium large format cinemas. So also there was a, a, a sort of a classification for the type of movies that were being shown in these theaters. 
um, where some were classified as first-run theaters. So it's a cinemas in which um, mainstream films are being showed from uh, the major film companies and distributors during the initial uh, new release period. The second run or discount theater were uh, movie, the movie theaters that run films that had already shown in the first run uh, theaters and were presented at a lower pri ticket price. Uh, they were also known as dollar theaters and cheap seats. Then you had some repertoire, repertory theater art houses, where so theaters in which um, art films and alternative films were being shown uh, on a second run or classic or classic uh, basis. And um, so that's what we would cl classify as independent cinemas in the UK. And of course, you had some adult movie theaters and sex movies that you can see in Soho, for example, in Pigalle, also in France, uh, that specialize in showing pornographic movies and the IMAX theaters that I mentioned before, where basically you can see some sort of documentaries with featuring natural scenery and, you know, very wide angles. So then in the 50s, the television came to the fore um, initially in black and white and then in color and um, in the mid 60s. And then this evolved to digital in the late 2000, then to 3D from 2010 onwards, that wasn't very successful. And then to smart television from 2015 onwards. And that is actually quite successful. Um, so this uh, television system, which is the second media channel, we mentioned movie theaters, the first one which was ever created, um, from a chronological standpoint, the second one, as I said, chronologically speaking, which ar arose in the 20s was television. And um, and so television can be provided through different ways. Uh, so it could be through terrestrial television and also cable television, satellite television and internet television. So um, Terrestrial television still exists, of course, and it has mostly the, um, you know, the state channels like the BBC in, in the UK or TFI MCs in France and um, the cable television such as Canal Plus or Sky and Virgin in the UK. And um, but this is decreasing in terms of, you know, the consumption of that. Then you have satellite television as well. And also uh, internet television, which online television, which is basically um, also the um, deliver covers the delivery of television series and other video content over the internet by video streaming technology. So it usually internet television use, uses mostly streaming. Then you also have as a third category of film distribution, personal home viewing. So this is home video, which is uh, pre-recorded media content sold or rented for home viewing. So initially, this started with the VHS video home system and also Betamax in the US. They used to have Betamax in the mid 70s. And um, uh, also there was a, a use of uh, videotapes initially, videotapes. And, and um, uh, this is carried over to optical disc formats, such as DVDs, Blu-ray, and, sh and, and then now streaming media. And um, people, some people still have you know, DVDs and, uh, and Blu-ray. Uh, but streaming obviously is uh, is very much increasing in the uh, personal home viewing field. And so the home video business distributes films, television series, telev telefilms and other individual media in the form of videos in various formats of the public. Um, they are either rented or, or bought and then watched private, privately in consumers' homes. So... Um, while DVDs remain popular in China, the video CD format has gradually lost popularity since the late 2010s and early 2020s when streaming media became mainstream. So uh, the transition from disc-based viewing to a streaming culture is best illustrated by the, by the Netflix case. Netflix used to have a DVD by mail service, which in 2015, so like, 10 years ago, still served 5.3 million subscribers in the US before and, uh, and then um, while it was also expanding its streaming services. Uh, in 2015, again, 
he had uh, Netflix had 65 million members. So it's interesting to see that Netflix at the time was balancing out, you know, male uh, DVD by male uh, subscribers with streaming subscribers. Um, I suppose that today in 2022, the um, DVD by mail service subscribers has, um, must, must have diminished enormously. So alongside early entrant Netflix, the film streaming business counts the following streaming services, um, online video platforms, so OVPs as they are called, which are product, productized services that enable users to upload, convert, store, and playback video content on the internet, often via a structured, scalable solution that can be monetized, such as Brightco, Cultura, uh, PowerStream, and Clickstream. Um, two of the um, uh, big players in this um, uh, OVP's uh, sector were Oyola and uh, Sorensen Media, but they have now disappeared. Also, user-generated content sites in the streaming uh, sector, um, UGC sites, are basically online platforms that contain any form of content, such as images, videos, text, and audios that have been used by users, such as YouTube, Vimeo, Dailymotion, Vidla. And also, of course, you have the streaming video on demand service providers, so the SVOD providers. So they are subscription based or ad based online platforms which provide streaming video on demand services to users by allowing them to access via streaming videos without a traditional video playback device such as desktop client application. And the constraints of a uh, typical static broadcasting schedule. So these SVOD providers include, of course, Netflix, but also Amazon Prime, Hulu, Disney Plus, Peacock, HBO Max, and Paramount Plus. And we also have a fourth channel of um, uh, distribution for films, which is in-flight entertainment, as well as the whole gamut of, um, of uh, uh, journey traveling, uh, sorry, uh, uh, traveling and uh, and film consumption during traveling. So in-flight entertainment refers to entertainment available to aircraft passengers during a flight, and it's a popular way to watch films and other video entertainment, either via a large screen uh, at the front of a cabin section, or more commonly via personal television sets located in front of each passenger's seat. Other type of uh, journey film watching facilities can exist on trains, cars, especially now that we have cars which can uh, drive themselves without the uh, driver being attentive, uh, ferries, boats, hotels, uh, spacecrafts, etc. So this, this uh, sort of in-flight or journey entertainment is the fourth avenue for film distribution. So which contractual um, models are being used for uh, film and train uh, uh, for, for 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 distribution of films. Um, well, first and foremost, let's have a look at the uh, various stakeholders involved in entering into distribution agreements. You've got, of course, the owner, which is the person who or legal entity that owns the distribution rights, so the theatrical rights, referring to film screenings in cinemas, but also the TV rights and the video on demand rights to a film title. And there's also the distributor, which is the legal entity which will distribute the film title in a defined territory for a defined term via a license or an assignment of the above mentioned distribution rights granted by the owner. While the categorization of contractual parties seems plain and simple, uh, it's often less so in practice because many distributors find themselves dealing with a producer who neither owns nor controls the distribution rights. So therefore, to identify the owner, a review of a chain of title, which is the process whereby the documentation that establishes proprietary rights in a film is reviewed in detail in order to clarify who exactly owns such rights, is it, it must be performed. So a chain of title must be performed. Also, like producers, there are many different kinds of entities that go by the name of distributors. Um, while they do not all have the same function or structure, that function or structure is critical for the owner to understand as it will determine, among other things, the resources of the distributor, their business practice, 
as well as um, of how many different parties are taking a piece of a revenues generated by the owner's motion picture before any of it will come back to the owner's pockets. As set out on the professional versions of the website IMDB, when one opens the company's drop down menu to click on distributors, one will find that what appears to be an, eno uh, an enormous amount of, uh, 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 of companies, literally thousands of them, that define themselves as distributors on this database, uh, the professional version of INDB. This list of distributors can be subcategorized uh, through major studios, which are also called majors and studios, such as Warner Brothers, Paramount, Universal, Disney, Fox, and Sony Pictures, which due to their size, can distribute directly, including via uh, subsidiaries and um, affiliates throughout most of the world. Their size typically makes their majors less flexible in their agreements. And um, sorry, their size makes uh, typically makes the majors less flexible in their agreements, more likely to rely on precedent and more concerned with a liability at as the deep pocketed party in any transaction, as well as with a release of majors, major films, so which are movies in the highest budget range, i.e. $100 million and above, uh, which they tend to be the exclusive distributors of. Then the second, second category, subcategory of, um, of distributors are the independent distributors, also called the mini majors, such as Lion Gates, and now uh, defunct the Weinstein Company um, in Famously Famous, <laughs> um, STX as well, which is, uh, and also the now defunct Broad Green, um, which in the USA maintained their own the theatrical distribution through licensing their pictures to movie theaters and then collecting their share of box office receipts from cinemas. They also have some home video distribution in place, those mini majors, although the physical distribution of DVDs may be serviced by a major. And they also license directly to VOD and television. And outside the USA, they license their motion picture territory by territory to local distributors. Although some like Lionsgate may also have ownership in one or more of their foreign distributors as well. So alongside those majors, the major studios, the independent distributors, you also have divisions of the majors, which with their own personalities and uh, histories, such as Universal owned Focus, Sony owned Screen Gens, Disney owned Searchlight Pictures, One owned New Line, which in the USA have access to a parent company's distribution operations, but typically administer their own marketing. And outside the USA, may be able to use the parent company output deals and other distribution advantages and also act as a foreign sales agent licensing territory by territory. Then as another category or subcategory of distributors, you also have the sales agents such as Film Nations and XYZ Films, which although technically not distributors, since they do not generally own the copyright distribution rights in the pictures that they license, they are mandated by the producer and copyright owners to market their picture to foreign distributors to negotiate territorial agreements with those distributors, often on a pre-buy basis before the picture is even produced and to deliver a picture to the distributors when it is completed, all on behalf of the owner as his or her exclusive agent. Then another subcategory of distributors are also the financiers and production companies, such as the Participant, Rat Pack, and Legendary, which, although being listed as distributors on the INDB platform, are not with a clarification uh, that many significant produce, production companies maintain the in-house capability to also directly license the pictures they produce to foreign territorial distributors, such as foreign sales agents. And last but not least, the SVOD providers, that which I mentioned before, such as Netflix, Amazon Studios, and Disney Plus, although they are better characterized as end users rather than distributors in the various territories in which they operate, and the distribution agreements uh, are more, more properly characterized as digital licenses, um, 
are distinguished primarily by the fact that there is no division of revenues involved. Netflix, for example, is not sharing the subscription fees it receives with any owner of uh, of the um, intellectual property rights on the on the on the film. Thus, even when um, Netflix acquires all the worldwide rights in perpetuity to a motion picture prior to production and builds it as a Netflix original. They agree to make a fixed buyout payment with no additional net profits, royalties, or other accountings to this owner. Now that the various parties to a distribution agreement have been identified, um, as we just mentioned, the majors, the mini studios, the independent distributors, the divisions of the majors, the sales agents, the financiers and, financiers and production companies, and the SVOD providers. So now that we've identified these various parties, let's delve into the main types of film distribution agreements available on the market, shall we? Um, so the acquisition agreement is an agreement that may be used by a US-based distributor to acquire the rights in all or many media in the US and often Canada, um, the so-called domestic market. So many of the provisions in this acquisition agreement reflect the leverage that US distributors have by virtue of the importance of a domestic territory, both because of its size and the usual leading role US release takes in marketing English language movies worldwide. Then there's also the IFTA distribution agreement, which is a template form provided by the Independent, Independent Film and Television Alliance, IFTA, which is the self-described global trade association for the independent motion picture and television industry. So the distribution agreement is used in many variations, primarily by foreign sales agents when licensing motion picture rights to foreign territorial distributors. So many of the differences between this um, IFTA distribution agreement form and the acquisition agreement served to illustrate the relatively weak leverage of typical foreign distributors, excluding those in major foreign territories such as China, the UK, France, and Japan. Then the fourth type of um, distribution agreements is the negative pickup agreement, which um, while there is no uh, negative to pick up these days, still survives in its uh, title and concept. The distributor, primarily US-based and probably a major studio, agrees before a picture is produced to pay the entire cost of production of a picture upon delivery in return for the copyright and all of the rights to the uh, picture worldwide and in perpetuity. So this uh, negative pickup agreement is in many ways an extreme version of the acquisition agreement. And then last but not least, the sales agency agreement in which no distribution rights are granted to the sales agent. So this is not really a um, distribution agreement at all, yet the um, agent is engaged by the copyright owners or the filmmaker and or the filmmaker to find, negotiate and enter into um, distribution agreements on behalf of the filmmaker as its exclusive agent. So in this sales agency agreement, the approvals and controls shift to the filmmaker and the sales agent typically provides no advance or minimum guarantee, of course, um, to the filmmaker. So sales agents, however, often play a significant role in assisting filmmakers finance their pictures through pre-sales. Uh, more on this later. So some of the crucial provisions set out in a film distribution agreements are, um, well, the picture specifications to identify the commodity that the distributor is purchasing or licensing, such as its title, the date it was screened by the distributor, the promised rating, which is usually formulated with reference to the Motion Picture Association of America categories, but also sometimes include local rating designations as well. Then there's also the length and technical specifications relating to whether the picture is being shot on film or more commonly nowadays in digital HD. And um, also if a distributor is acquiring distribution rights earlier in the production process, uh, screenplay, genre, production budget, cast, director. So in addition to these picture specifications, uh, the distribution agreement is going to deal with the essential elements, which are uh, the 
since the value of pictures sold on a, on a pre-buy basis is determined by the attachment of star actors or less frequently a star director. So the star actors and um, star director are what are being called the essential elements. Okay, so um, picture specifications, essential elements, but also advertising um, rights, which are the rights to advertise the picture using the name and the likeness of the uh, essential elements granted to the distributor. Then the approvals of the respective distributor or agent, which may range from almost none in the sales agency agreement to virtually total control of every production element and aspect and the respective agreements relating to those elements in the negative pickup agreement. So it's like very different, the, the range. Um, for the approvals of a respective distributor. And then also um, another very important element of a distribution agreement is, of course, its term, which in large territories such as the US may extend for 15, 25 years or even perpetuity sometimes, while um, is usually seven years from delivery of a picture to the distributor in smaller foreign territories. Then the territory, which is defined on a granular level still in this day and age, in most distribution agreements, given the vested commercial interest of distributors and right owners in the territorial system of uh, distribution, uh, but which is becoming increasingly irrelevant and out of touch with reality in the SVOD and streaming era, where the expectation of consumers, like myself, like yourselves, is that all content will be immediately available everywhere. Um, more on this later. But for the moment, the territory is still um, defined on a, you know, uh, like uh, country by, by country basis or region by region basis on, in most distribu film distribution agreements. Then also there's a definition of rights, i.e. the exploitation rights on which the media, the film will be exploited, the advertising rights, um, as mentioned uh, uh, before, the ancillary rights, such as, for example, the right to exhibit the pictures on airlines, in ships, and in hotels, but also the right to create um, action figures and T-shirts via merchandising, especially for action uh, action films and action uh, hero films, and also the derivative rights, so the right to create some sequels, some prequels, some remakes, and television series. Um, also, the film distribution agreement deals with holdbacks and windows, since the theatrical exhibition business still relies commercially on being the first medium of exploitation uh, of motion pictures with theater owners and particularly large cinema chains pushing back against screening films in any significant numbers that are available in any other medium at the same time. And the minimum guarantee is also uh, uh, defined in the film distribution agreement. Uh, it is the amount payable by the distributor to the owner as an advance against the owner's share of distribution revenues. And it is the basis for much of independent film picture financing as lenders will loan a discounted amount against the aggregate minimum guarantees already secured by the owner or its agents. For the production of the movie. Also, the gross receipts and the application are being defined and uh, structured through the um, provisions of the film distribution agreement. So the gross receipts mean the revenues actually received by the distributor, less off the top deduction of certain limited expenses, such as the collection costs and the bank fees, but also less distribution fees, formulated as a percentage of gross receipts and less distribution expenses, in particular advertising, attending film markets such as uh, Cannes, Toronto, uh, the IFTAS AFM in Santa Monica and Berlin in February each year. And um, less also the recruitment of the minimum guarantee. And uh, last but not least, the theatr theatrical release commitments, which um, despite the ongoing disruption of a traditional motion picture theatrical release model, by SVOD providers and UGC sites remains the holy grail of many filmmakers sought after for the prestige, exposure, and potential financial bonanza that they believe a picture and career deserve. So for example, I'm sure you remember that um, Christopher uh, Nolan um, and uh, also um, Wes Anderson refused to have their films 
um, released during the pandemic years in 2020 and 2021 because of the lockdowns and they absolutely wanted to have a theatrical release. So therefore, uh, the two latest title, respective title, they, they, their respective titles were um, uh, basically um, released only in uh, 2000, at the end of 2021, or beginning of 2022, uh, because they wanted to have this uh, this theatrical window. So now that we have a look at what the uh, film distribution agreement um, contain, what kind of film distribution agreement exists, and our market practice, we also had a look at what the various um, film distribution channels are nowadays. Now let's have a look at how streaming changed the game in the um, uh, in film distribution. It's been almost a revolution uh, for the, the, the film distribution business. Well, while the music industry was plagued by the likes of Napster and um, uh, in the early noughties, the film sector has also been seriously disrupted by the consumer's ability to download peer-to-peer -peer files. In particular, video format files such as .mp4 or .move illegally on the internet. So illegal peer-to-peer -peer websites such as Emule, Cute BitTorrent, uTorrent, and CDAR still exist today. Uh, but consumers may prefer to use illegal SVOD providers such as Popcorn Time, which are much easier to use. And they are widely uh, available and still very much in use, actually. So this acceleration into the digitalization of film distribution, thanks to better internet connections and speed, as well as the above mentioned peer to peer technology, has permanently and negatively and also irremediably affected the scale of film distribution in all other non-digital medium, such as uh, movie theaters, of course, but also TV networks, DVDs, Blu-ray, etc. So all these other uh, non-digital media uh, have, uh, have suffered and um, consumers nowadays favor watching content via the streaming or, or uh, internet television, um, as opposed to going to the cinema, um, watching TV and um, watching DVDs and Blu-rays, etc. So if we still develop this comparison with the film industry, we can see that um, uh, the film, the music industry uh, understood very swiftly that CDs, cassettes, vinyl, vinyls, and mini discs were things of the past and decided to take back control of the narrative by making music streaming legal as quickly as possible via subscription-based or ad-based digital service providers. So tech, tech companies, high-tech companies providing music streaming services such as Apple Music, Spotify, Deezer, Tidal, and Amazon Music. They are called DSPs, digital service providers. And so these easily affordable monthly subscription plans offered by these DF DSPs gave a fatal blow to peer-to-peer uh, -peer music sites in the mid noughties uh, since consumers would rather pay between you know, five to 20 pounds per month rather and to access catalogs of millions of songs rather than spend time energy and effort uh, not to mention as well risking having the internet connection terminated by the uh, internet service provider for acts of piracy downloading files so um, in the music industry the uh, transition from analog to digital film dis distribution was somehow accelerated and uh, facilitated by the very self-aware approach of uh, um, content providers and i.e. the music labels, the music publishers and the acts themselves and they understood almost straight away that they had to play the game okay it was irreversible this change was irreversible going to you know more um, online consumption of content However, the film industry, industry was and still is um, way much, uh, way less nimble uh, and less realistic and flexible in adapting to the new realities of this um, of this digital era. 
So um, the distribution side of a business, of a film business in particular, has resisted and still does resist any cost-effective, customer-friendly and affordable digital solution to its film distribution model. As a result, piracy has and still is thriving in the motion picture sector with customers routinely using peer-to-peer peer-to-peer platforms and illegal SVOD providers, such as Pop Time for Popcorn, to find movies they want to watch for free. Even those people who use music streaming services, the DSPs, so uh, they already are um, consuming uh, lawfully some, uh, some music content, uh, but um, uh, since they can't find their they films, uh, that they want to watch on the particular streaming pr platforms that they maybe subscribe to, then they have to shop on the internet to, to pirate the film away. Um, and, um, and yeah, even when they are also uh, subscribing to SVOD providers, um, uh, then, then they still download movies and TV series illegally, even today in 2022. And that is the crux of the matter in the film distribution today. Um, which is that customers want to have access to all the video content all at once, anywhere, anytime, while film distributors and owners, as well as also states and governments, are only prepared to distribute this content on a granular basis and to drip feed movies on a limited number of SVOD platforms, usually after the theatrical window has elapsed, um, which, for example, in France is between 22 to 36 months following theatrical release to allow for the pay TV release window and then the free TV window before streaming. So consumers are not happy with that. If the film comes out, they want to have access to it and online. And um, at least they want to have a choice, you know, maybe they will want to watch it with uh, the family in the, 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 the theatre, in the cinemas, but most of the time they don't, they prefer to watch it from the comfort of their own home cocooning. And so not only that, but the number of streaming platforms um, has shot up through the roof, with every major studio now having its own SVOD provider and therefore pulling off its own catalogue from competing SVOD providers, owned by pure tech companies such as Netflix, Apple TV, and Amazon Prime, or owned by rival studios such as HBO Max, Paramount Plus, Disney Plus, and Hulu, or owned by media conglomerates such as Peacock. So let's take the example of Netflix. They just released today or yesterday, I think, the uh, figures for this quarter, the, qu the third quarter of 2022, and they were like, hooray! Uh, we've actually acquired 2.4 um, million new subscribers um, mainly in Asia, by the way, not in the US, because the market is completely saturated in the US. And um, okay, so that's interesting. But what is also very interesting is because so much of the catalog and and uh, previous content um, uh, from the um, Netflix from Netflix has been pulled out by the uh, the majors because now they have their own SVOD platforms and uh, therefore they've just terminated the licenses with um, with Netflix Netflix and um, they've put the this 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 content only on their own platform I think this is the case for the office and other TV series which used to be um, on Netflix now these all these have been pulled out and returned back to the um, to the owner uh, so there are now streaming platforms for each genre and sub-genre for documentaries enthusiasts, for example, such as History Vault, Magellan TV, PBS Documentaries, Guide Doc, horror fans such as Schroeder and Tubi, etc. It's another saturated market. There are too many streaming services nowadays. Therefore, um, customers who want to play by the rules, so to speak, have to subscribe and pay monthly subscribe subscription fees to four to 10 SVOD providers at once in order to cover the market, so to speak, and in terms of accessing large libraries and catalogs of movies, ancient and new. This is all the more plex perplexing since a Spotify premium plan user will have access to more than 80 million music tracks i.e. around 80% of the total number of songs in the world on that DSP Spotify 
for the modest sum of £9.99 per month. So there's here a sort of complete, you know, if again, if we look at this comparison with the music industry, there's just like this complete disconnect here. Why would consumers pay £10 per month or €10 Euros per month to have access to 80 million songs, i.e. almost everything in the catalogue of songs worldwide, while for movies, you would have to pay £500 or €500 Euros per month to be able to see, you know, just uh, probably um, 25 to 30% of the catalogue of uh, all films released in the world. It's, it's, the, the, something is is not is is not clicking here, so no wonder that piracy is still very much an issue in the movie business, with only few, and to be frank, quite undiscerning customers ready to fork uh, hundreds of you of dollars, uh, pounds or euros per month in order to have lawful access to vast cat catalogs of films and video content online. I was reading yesterday in the news that um, um, UK consumers at the moment are uh, terminating their uh, subscription to streaming services, film subscription, uh, film streaming services like crazy at the moment, moment because of a cost of life crisis and all that jazz and this inflation costs. So, um, so yes, yeah, so, so 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 it's it's not sustainable. This oversaturation of a streaming market. And this uh, lack of uh, user-friendly access to um, to films, um, so 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 yeah. So what what what's going to happen? What's 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 looming? Well, there's a need for consolidation and aggregation in the film distribution business model. Obviously, um, it is clear that film owners and distributors need to become more self-aware by taking a long and hard look at the licensing value of a content of a catalogs in this new market paradigm in which no consumer in their right mind will spend more than between 25 to 50 pounds euros per month in order to have access to large catalogs of newly released movies as well as catalogs of old films via SVOD platforms. Also, film distribution via traditional media such as movie theaters is bound to decrease over time due to changing consumer habits or prefer to cocoon at home and also in the wake of the COVID pandemic. Um, I was reading recently that um, um, statistics show that um, the attendance at um, uh, cinemas is still, um, I think between one third to 50% lower than what it used to be pre-pandemic. So, uh, and I, I really don't think we're ever going to recover to be honest. I think, you know, um, consumers' uh, behaviors have changed um, irremediably now. So adult, uh, sorry, in 2021, adult US, uh, US adults saw an average, on average 1.4 movies in a cinema in the past 12 months. 1.4 movies was just like, you know, the action hero flick of a year and they went to see with the kids or something. But um, yeah, cable TV and pay TV are also on the path of extinction, with a number of US PV, pay TV subscribers forecasted to fall by 28% each year between 2013 and 2023. So personally, the only diversification that I foresee for film distribution in the, fu in the future is the in-flight entertainment segment with the increase and in development of space tourism Spaces um, commercial exploitation by behemoths such as SpaceX, Tesla, and Blue Origin, Amazon, as well as space stations set up by governments, space agencies, and private companies. Well, of course, when all these uh, people are going to go on very long flights, um, they will need to consume content and get you know to do something with their uh, with, with their cells in these long long during these long flights. And um, yeah, so uh, so this is probably where. Um, there will be more uh, film content being watched in the future as well. And, and also probably also the more our cars are becoming automated and um, drivers' attentions are going to be less and less required for cars to drive themselves from point A to point B. So I suppose that while they are um, traveling with their cars doing all of the work, 
passengers and um, and uh, drivers could actually watch some content as well. So these really this this sort of um, uh, in flight and and in journey entertainment segment is is the only um, area where I, I I foresee growth. So what does this all mean for stakeholders in the music industry in the film industry? Sorry. Well, since the development of the above mentioned in-flight entertainment segment is a very long-term game, obviously, because um, we're not routinely going to space yet, as far as I'm aware. So stakeholders in the, mu in the movie uh, business need to focus on making the digital film distribution channels more efficient, streamlined, and consumer-friendly. First, there will be some consolidation in the film streaming sector with many existing SVOD providers either going extinct or being the targets of acquisitions in the next five years. Additional consolidation will be largely driven by SVOD providers' needs for larger content catalogs to satisfy consumers' insatiable demand for hit content. Also, pure digital players like Netflix, Amazon Prime, and Apple TV, managed by high-tech executives, steeped with uh, cost-cutting data-driven decisions and lean management methods professed by Silicon Valley, will force via competition as VOD providers owned by media and uh, entertainment conglomerates, major studios, and film distributors to shed dead weight and increase efficiencies and profitability. So there will be all this friction between the high-tech mentality and you know, the entertainment business, showbiz mentality. And, um, and in, 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 ineluctably, the um, um, entertainment uh, showbiz part of the business will have to become more efficient in, in you know, like the high-tech techies guy do. Second, there will be an even more aggressive push towards aggregation of SVOD services via super aggregators, which bundle non-competing tech services together. So for example, if you purchase an iPad in, a, in an Apple store, then you will get a one year free license to the content on Apple TV. That happened to me a year ago when I bought my new iPad. And also there will be some um, ad hoc subscription-based apps bundling several SVOD services all in one app, such as Strum, S-T-R-U-U-M, S -T -R -U -U -M, and it gives you access to the content libraries from different SVOD providers. And I also um, uh, read recently that um, Peacock and um, Paramount and um, uh, many other ma majors um, SVOD platforms are congregating together on a, and also on a super aggregator. Eventually, eventually, when the current streaming wars will have dried out, only a few winners will remain. These lucky winners will shop around ferociously, either by way of mergers and acquisitions or assignments or licensing of catalogs in order to grab the largest possible content libraries because because people, consumers, they want to watch new movies, but also they want to watch the catalogs, you know, the old movies, um, the, the films that they watched when they were kids, uh, the films that they watched when they were teenagers, you know, all this stuff, even films that were before their times. So, um, so yeah, there will be this sort of grab, you know, for the catalogs for all these lucky winners of the streaming wars so that they have massive content libraries and therefore more, more customers um, that they can attract. It is at this cost and after weeding all these weaker competitors out that this handful of appropriate film streaming services will finally be on offer in the video content industry for consumers. Then piracy will subside because consumers will no longer need um, piracy to have access to very large content libraries uh, while only paying reasonably priced monthly subscription fees uh, to the lucky free streamers still standing. I mean, personally, I think this is going to be a, a very um, wasteful and um, and uh, long, I mean, long process um, and uh, a waste of time and money to reach more or less exactly the same um, outcome and status quo than in the music industry, which has only you know three or four DSPs standing. So, namely, Spotify, Deezer, Tidal and Amazon Music. But the thing is that because of all these um, inefficiencies in the film industry, this will only happen in around 10 to 15 years time. Like there will be a delay um, of around 10 years to 15 years 
to have the same level of advancement in the streaming sphere in uh, um, in the film industry than than we have now in the music industry and i think it's a bit of a um of a shame but um, um it's clear that um the hollywood way of doing business is not going to um um you know go away quickly um anytime soon especially if um the only ceos in place at all these major studios are you know the kind of um white man uh, in the 50s to the 60s and 70s that is happening at the moment in hollywood in the us so yeah there's going to be a slow change in the uh, movie industry but eventually it will happen in for for the for the best for consumers i think in film distribution on this note i am done i thank you very much for um your um basically your custom and um and your attendance and don't hesitate to check out our uh, written content on thought leadership articles on crefovy.com slash store you can access there and get our uh, a subscription for one year to um, our weekly newsletter our written content etc and um, on if you want to have a french version of that you can also subscribe on crefovy.fr slash magasin okay on this note i thank you so much and I bid you my farewell. Until next time.